Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. Uh, I have a lot of energy, so hopefully you can keep up. But if not, you can go hang out with the kids. Uh, they'll, they'll keep you awake. So as Dave said, my name is Jordan Howell. Uh, I actually came to, came to know the Lord about 10 years ago. And my first touch point from that was back home and was getting involved at this church. And so it's just sweet to be back with you guys. Want to give you a little introduction to who I am. Have a picture here. This is my family. So my beautiful bride, Ellie, and our three boys, Blaze, is on my lap. He's a three-year-old. Uh, Leo, with the glasses, is two. And then Silas, there, sitting on Ellie's lap, is five months old. So three boys under the age of three. You can pray for us when you think about us. Uh, we need it, but I currently serve as a college ministry pastor in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at Veritas Church, which is a part of the SALT Network. How many of you guys have heard of SALT Company before? Yeah, several of you. Uh, it's kind of sweet. This last February, I was teaching at a, at a breakout at the SALT Company conference, and I look out, and I see Sierra Hill, and I was like, whoa, I feel old because she was in my VBS class one of the last times I was here, which is just insane. But we also, uh, though we're serving in Cedar Rapids right now, we announced to our members in May that Ellie and I will be planting a church in 2025 in partnership with the SALT Network at a new university center that is yet to be determined. So uh, our ambition within the SALT Network is to plant healthy local churches in every university center across America to make it easy for students going to college to, to get the gospel. So we're excited for what's coming. If you didn't know, I'm from Manson. Any Cougars in the crowd? Yeah, come on, Cougars. I'm not here to stir division, but uh, go Cougars. I graduated, went to Iowa State. Cyclones in the crowd. Love it. Roll clones. I uh, came to know the Lord my junior year of college. And as I said, I came back here, and that was my first, like, touch with ministry. And from that moment forward, I knew that this is what I was supposed to do. So, uh, you know, winding route sometimes to get there, but landed in Cedar Rapids. And I don't know how many of you know this. But you've been partnering with us in ministry in Cedar Rapids. We've been there since 2019. And in the last four years, we've seen 88 college students baptized. Amazing. Like, yeah. And uh, sweet update for you guys. We, we sent five students overseas this summer to Bangkok, Thailand, which if you don't know, Bangkok is a massive city. There's over a million college students in that city and only... 0.5% are evangelical Christian. Very unreached. And over the last two weeks, there have been two Thai students who have given their lives to Christ. So it's just cool to see how God would start something in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and send college students to the nation so that people would encounter the gospel of Christ. It's sweet. I feel like I'm doing my dream job. And, uh, yeah, I couldn't ask for much more than to just be a vessel in, in the Lord's work and what he's doing. And speaking of dreams, you guys all know what a dream is, right? You've had a dream. It, like one definition of a dream is a thought, image, or sensation experienced during sleep. How many of you guys have those kind of dreams? A few of you? All right. Another definition, a dream is a cherished aspiration, ambition, or ideal. How many of you have those kind of dreams? Hopefully everybody, all right? I know we're in church. You might not be used to raising your hand. You, you better get used to it, all right? We all have dreams. We all have dreams. We know what we want life to look like and to feel like. We know what we want our experience to be. You know, for some of us in the, in the room, maybe it's like, oh, I dream of having a boat or moving to the mountains or retiring early, you know, students in the room, maybe you're dreaming of winning a state championship or, you know, earning a scholarship to go to college and not pay an arm and a leg. I mean, we all have ambitions, and the reality is, whatever we're dreaming about, we're willing to sacrifice for. You know, if you want to save money, you're willing to sacrifice some of your extra shopping or eating out. If you want to get good grades or maybe earn a promotion at work, you're willing to sacrifice some sleep to get in and do the hard work that is necessary. If you want to win a state championship, you're willing to sacrifice some late nights with your friends, making silly decisions 
so that you can wake up early and go to the weight room. But these are just selfish ambitions, oftentimes. And ambition in in and of itself, I have to say, is a gift from God. All right? God has placed within us a desire for more. This inward ambition that's meant to spur us on to life and godliness. And if you don't believe me, I want to read just a couple verses for you here. Philippians 3, this is Paul to the Philippian church. He says this, Philippians 3 verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Then he says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So he says, if you're a mature Christian, here's what you should do. You should have ambition. And here's what your ambition should be. The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We should have that ambition. And when you talk about a dream as an ambition, there's also this other dream that's given to us at the end of our Bible. Revelation 21. This is John from the island of Patmos. He gets a vision from the Lord that is actually seeing this ambition unraveled, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Here's what John says in Revelation 21. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Can I get an amen? Whoa. How many of you are like wrapped up in that dream, that ambition? All of us ought to be. But then the question is, What's it going to take to see this dream realized? Right? This is another ambition. This is another thing set before us that it's like, hey, we all want it, but what's it going to take? And are are we willing to embrace what it's going to take to go on this journey? So we're going to be in Genesis 37. If you have a physical Bible, we'd love for you to pull it out. It's really important for us to see these words on the pages of scripture, not just a screen. So I believe there's Bibles in your pews. It should be page 24, Genesis 37. As you get your Bibles out, I just want to remind you of the context of this story. So Moses is writing this book, Genesis, and he's writing it to the Israelites. Actually, the audience that is engaging with Genesis is wandering in the wilderness. This is in between them being set free from slavery in Egypt and them entering the promised land in Canaan. So the Israelites are reading this book and what they've seen so far in Genesis is the origin of the world, the origin of sin, but most importantly, they've seen the covenant of God. In Genesis 3, shortly after the fall, they see that God has promised a promised seed through Eve. This promised seed would come and he would crush the devil's head. He would be the ruler, the reigner, the redeemer, and and sin and death would be done away with. And just a few short chapters later, Genesis 12, we see God establish a covenant with a guy by the name of Abram. He comes to Abram and he says, hey, I want you to go. I want you to leave. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. And here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you new land. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you and make your name great. I'm going to bless all the peoples of the world through you and your descendants. And so from these two covenants, the people of Israel have been tracking this storyline all throughout Genesis. You know, tracking the promised seed, trying to figure out who is the promised seed? Has he come? What is the promised land? Have we been there? And 
we've seen these storylines weave, and honestly, the promises have been threatened, haven't they? Sin is just waging war on these promises, but God is so sovereign. He protects his covenant all throughout the story. So you get Adam's family line, and then you get Noah's family line. You have Abraham, who has his son Ishmael, and then Isaac. We get their storylines, and then you have Isaac's sons, Esau and Jacob. And we're just now getting into Jacob's storyline, Genesis 37. Read with me the first 11 verses in Genesis 37. This is the word of God. It says, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. That's important. Remember that. In the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, another name for Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said this to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon, the eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. Now imagine with me, all right, you're Israel, wandering in the wilderness, and you are reading this storyline. You're beginning to engage not just with the line of Jacob, but the story of Joseph. And you hear of this young man who's born in the land of Canaan, which is, by the way, the promised land, and he has not just been declared the favorite. Any favorite children in the room? Just me? Yeah. It's not as easy as it sounds, right? I'm a son to my dad in his old age, favorite son. It's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, but he was not just a favorite son. He was given a royal robe. In many of your Bibles, if you were to look at the bottom, might have this translation that would say a robe with long sleeves. And here's what's true. A robe with long sleeves actually indicated that he was to be the overseer of his family. So he would not have to roll his sleeves up to do the hard work of pasturing the flock anymore because he was going to be in charge. It starts to make a little bit more sense why his brothers hate him now, right? They're like, wait, you're going to rule and reign over us? And then he has these two dreams, which in the book of Genesis actually indicate divine revelation. That God is speaking to Joseph. He is affirming this call to rule and reign, this call to power. And if you're Israel, engaging in this story in the wilderness, you have to be thinking, is this the promised seed? Is this the Messiah? Is this the redeemer that was promised? It kind of seems like it. But if you keep reading the story, this dream of a redeemer figure in Joseph seems to fade. He's sent by his father to go check on his brothers who were pasturing the flock, and he walks close to 65 miles to find them. I mean, most of us can't hit a 10,000 step count in a day. Let's be real. This guy walks 65 miles to find his brothers, and as, as he approaches, here's what the text says. Verse 18, they saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. 
They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. They are totally mocking him. And they're like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cut this guy off. Now again, if you're Israel, you have to be concerned. The promised seed, maybe, the redeemer cut off. Well, good thing is, he has two brothers that are looking out for him. Maybe. (laughs) One of them is Reuben. And as you keep reading, you'll find out that Reuben tries to protect Joseph's life. He tries to talk his brothers out of killing him and says, hey, how about we just throw him into a pit instead? But I don't know if Reuben was really that concerned about saving Joseph's life. I think if you look at the text, there's a good indication that he might be more concerned about reestablishing his birthright. Because just two chapters before, Genesis 35, he lost his birthright as a firstborn son because he slept with his father's concubine. So he has lost his sense of power. Now Joseph has this sense of power. And maybe, just maybe, Reuben is saying, if I save his life, maybe I'll get my birthright back. But God's willing to use it. He ends up in a pit instead of dead. And so rather than killing him, they strip him of this royal robe and they throw him into an empty pit. And then the brothers roll out their picnic blanket and they have their sack lunch. It just shows how calloused these men are. That their brother is thrown into a pit with no water, essentially left for dead, and they're just eating a snack while he's crying out. But while they're enjoying this meal, they see Ishmaelite or Midianite traders coming. And then you see this second brother step up. And he has a great idea. Verse 26, Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Now, Maybe Judah was really concerned about not letting Joseph die, or maybe he wanted to make a buck. Anybody in here want to make a buck, right? (laughs) Like, this is not new. This deception and this cruelty, this greed, this love for money might motivate Judah, but again, God uses it. Joseph is sold for 20 shekels of silver, And then these brothers do something interesting. They use their dad's own tactic against him. They use the sacrifice of a goat. And just like Jacob wore the skin of the goat to deceive Isaac in Genesis 27, these brothers dip the robe in goat blood and bring it back to their dad. And Jacob grieves. He is inconsolable. He says, let me go down to Sheol with him. And then by the end of the story, we see Joseph sold again in Egypt to a guy by the name of Potiphar, who was a prestigious military officer in the court of Pharaoh. And right now you have to be asking, hi, Blaze, you should go back with mom. I know you want to be a preacher, but he said before he's going to preach the word. So, hey, bud, I love you. Go back to mom. His day's made. Um... Let's reel it back here. All right, you're Joseph. You've been given this dream. You have a royal robe. Like you're going to rule and rise to power. How's that going? Not good. Sin has the upper hand. His experience is not one of rule and reign, but abandonment and betrayal. Unjust suffering at the hand of others has the upper hand and is prevailing. And we know all too well what this feels like, don't we? I mean, many of us, we have the, either the coffee cups or the wall decor or the bumper stickers. You've heard the verse before, Jeremiah 29, 11. We'll have it on the screen. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. 
And oftentimes this verse is quoted out of context to kind of promote this subculture within Christianity of prosperity. Like, give your life to Jesus and everything's going to be better. You will have wholeness, you will have health and wealth, all of your plans will succeed. It's going to go great. No. If you follow Jesus for any amount of time, you know that is not true. So is Jeremiah 29, 11 a lie or what's happening here? Well, if you would read the verse right before, the prophet Jeremiah is actually letting them know, here's what's true. You're going to be in Babylonian exile for 70 years. 70. And then... I have a promise for you. I have a plan for you. It's welfare. It is a future and a hope. And that is good news. But we have to stop here and just say, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. We all want immeasurable peace. We all want unending joy. We all want unconditional love. And can we find that in the person work of Christ? Yes, absolutely we can. But here's what else is true you're still going to deal with disease and death. You still might face betrayal and broken relationships. You still might struggle with money or mental health. And that doesn't make God not good. We might stop and say, God, I signed up for the good. I signed up for the bright future, for the hope, not the exile. Do not give me that. And friends, I'm here to tell you, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. And John, last week, in kind of this overview of Genesis, had talked about God using Joseph's story to tell his story. I hope you can see this in Genesis 27. A beloved son, sent by his father, a great distance from heaven to earth, only to be hated by his own, sold for silver, a victim of unjust suffering. Who's the promised seed? Is it Joseph? The good news is, it's not. Because Joseph is meant to point forward to the seed that has come now, 2,000 years ago in the person work of Christ. And this is the reality. Jesus did not come the way the people expected. He did not come to rule and reign in power. He came as a baby in a manger. He lived a meek life as a carpenter boy from Nazareth. And then, as we all know, he suffered unjustly. As a sheep led to the slaughter, he was silent. And he not only took the physical anguish of crucifixion, he took the wrath of God on his head that we rightfully deserve. Though he was perfect. But the good news is, Jesus didn't stay dead. And what's really cool in Genesis 37 is you actually get resurrection language. That Joseph was brought up out of the pit. Now, in the book of Psalms, David will frequently talk about his life being in the pit. And when he says pit, he's referring to Sheol, the place of the dead. And that in Genesis 37, though the story is not done, we're already getting rings of resurrection. That Joseph is brought up out of the pit. And Jesus is alive today, church. And that's good news. Which means, yes, he did suffer. He did have unjust suffering. He had a difficult life. But he's ruling and reigning today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And now he's inviting us. He says, hey, you want the hope of eternal life? I've paid the price for you. So what's it going to take to get heaven? Number one, the price has already been paid for you. Jesus has already sacrificed on your behalf. He has done the finished work. And now he's saying, would you stop working so hard? Would you rest in me? Would you trust in my finished work? 
But also, here's what else happens. Jesus gives us resurrection power and then he says, go and do likewise. Like, you wanna be a follower of Jesus? You're not just invited into this wonderful resurrection narrative, though we are, but if you want to experience a resurrection narrative, you know what other narrative you need to embrace? The narrative of the cross. Whew. That's tough. Faith Community Church, you cannot have Christ without bearing your cross. And to Israel, as they engage with this text, what they might see is that you cannot have the promised land without the wilderness. We cannot have the hope of heaven without the hard journey to get there. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to just have a few verses on the screen to let the word of God do its work. All right. Matthew 16, verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, this instrument of death and humiliation, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Dying to yourself. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Romans 8, starting in verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Love that. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Philippians 3, Brian read out of Philippians 2 earlier. Philippians 3, this is Paul. Whatever gain I had, he looks at his spiritual resume, everything that he's earned. He says, I count it as a loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Here's where things get interesting. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We're like, yes! And may share his sufferings. Hmm. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul understood this. He's like, I, resurrection narrative, give me that. I want heaven. I want forever with Jesus. But that means I have to share in his sufferings too. I'm going to embrace the hard life of following Jesus. Because the life to come is so much better. Revelation 21. This is the verse that comes right after that beautiful dream and narrative of heaven. Here's what it says. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. There's two things that are true in this text. Revelation 21, seven, we have a heritage. You could say inheritance. This is a gift, something that has been purchased, something that has passed down to us. We do not earn it. And who is it promised to? The one who conquers the one who does not quit, the one who does not compromise, the one who embraces faithfulness in the midst of a dark and broken world to the one who conquers, you will have an inheritance. You see, suffering is a promise of the Christian life. It's a promise, but it's also a promise to the human existence, isn't it? Like, it's not just Christians that suffer. Everybody suffers. Maybe you've heard it said before, you're either in a season of suffering, you're heading out of a season of suffering, or you're heading into a season of suffering. Any of you guys heard that before? It resonates, doesn't it? It's real. 
Suffering is a part of the human existence. And so I want to give just two exhortations this morning. Just two pleas to action here. And the first is this. If you've never placed your faith in Christ, do not experience hardship without the hope of heaven. Do not experience hardship without the hope of heaven. You do not need to. Everybody suffers, but you do not have to suffer without hope. Because there is already one who has suffered on your behalf. So that you can actually understand that there's not just eternity to come, but you have a Savior who has been in the midst of suffering with you. That you don't have to suffer alone. Oftentimes that's the worst part of suffering is that we feel alone. And the good news of Christianity is that we have a suffering Savior. We follow a God who knows what it is like to weep and to bleed, to hurt deeply, to feel abandoned and betrayed. You do not have to suffer alone because you have Christ. But to the Christian in the room, I have to say, we have to flip this on its head and say, do not have the hope of heaven without an expectation of hardship. That's hard. We are far too quick to just look at the good news and not acknowledge the hard news that comes with it. Yes, we have resurrection. Yes, we have a a wonderful inheritance coming our way. But guess what? It's not the easy road. We are invited to embrace the cross, to enjoy Christ, to endure the wilderness, to inherit the promised land, to walk the hard journey ahead with the hope of heaven in our hearts. That's what we're invited into. It's what we see in the life of Joseph. Does he have a dream? Yes. Will his dream be realized? Yes, it will. Was the path there easy? Absolutely not. It's full of suffering. And faith family, let me be clear. When it comes to our inheritance, this heaven that I read about on the front, I think everybody ought to to cheer. We ought to hoot and holler. But I think one thing we miss as we look at heaven, our minds just instantly go to no more pain, no more suffering, no more grieving. We have loved ones that we long to be reunited with, but we miss the reality that the best part of heaven is God. The best part of heaven is intimacy with our creator. I mean, if you just begin to think about heaven and God is not at the center of it, I don't know how much you will enjoy heaven. God is the epicenter of heaven. He is what it's all about, that we get to be in perfect union and intimacy with our God. That is what heaven is all about. And that we will see that fully realized in our promised land, in our heaven. We will see this fully realized. We also catch glimpses in the wilderness, don't we? We catch glimpses in the wilderness. In between placing your faith in Christ and being set free from the bondage of sin, and in between your death and resurrection being reunited with Christ, we catch glimpses of intimacy with God in the wilderness. And I want to give you two encouragements this morning, too, as we just look quickly. Psalm 34. I read this this week, and... I felt like this is exactly what we needed to hear today. So Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And so here's an encouragement to you if you're in suffering. We don't have to suffer alone because we can be near to God. There is perhaps no place that you can be more near to the heart of God than in the midst of suffering. He is gentle and lowly in heart. And when he sees his children suffer, he longs to be close to you. Any of you that have had children that are hurting, you know this feeling. You just want to be with your child. And so if you're suffering right now, just know that is God's heart for you. He wants to be near to you. But also, if you keep reading in Psalm 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. 
which means we don't have to suffer in vain because we can trust to be delivered by God. We don't have to suffer in vain because we can trust to be delivered by God. And it might be in this lifetime and it might not be. Many of you might have known my dad who had a very hard life. Sick almost my entire life. And I remember as a child praying, though I did not really know the Lord, just that childlike faith praying, God, please heal my dad. Please heal my dad. Please heal my dad. And I thought I never saw it realized. But in March of 2016, my dad was healed. You know how? He went home to be with the Lord. And he's healed. Right? His suffering was not in vain. Because he did experience the promise. He did see his dreams, ambitions realized because he is face to face with his maker. So it's a good thing for us to say, yes, Lord, please heal me in this moment right now. God, I've seen you heal the blind, the leper. I've seen you raise the dead. And I believe you can. But maybe, just maybe, the healing you experience won't be in this life, but in the one to come. And it's still not in vain. And so if we would cling to the truths from Genesis 27, this promised inheritance, and the promised suffering, here's what would happen. We would be a people. Faith Community Church would be a church marked by hope and hardship. And that's what it means to be a light in the darkness. When you would be around family, at your workplace, in your neighborhood. I mean, this is rural Iowa. Everybody knows everything, right? People know what's going on in your life. And when they would see somebody experiencing hardship, that they would get an experience similar to what Peter is actually calling Christians to in 1 Peter 3. He's saying, live in such a way that people ask the reason for the hope that is within you. Wouldn't that be amazing? That we would be a church so marked by hope and hardship that when the winds and waves of this life come and people see peace, a strange sense of joy and hope that they would stop and they would be like, why do you have so much hope? And Peter says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that's within you. What's the defense? It's not apologetics, okay? It's the gospel. Here's my hope in life and death that Christ knows me and has made me his own and one day I will be with him forever. And I want to share the gospel with you in the midst of hardship that God would use some of the most horrific and challenging moments of our life to lead other people out of bondage that the gospel would advance in our families, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, not because we gave our lives to Christ and everything got better, but maybe quite the opposite, that we surrendered to the call of Christ on our life and that we embraced our cross and in that got to tell people about the hope that is within us. Wouldn't that be amazing? I mean, to just think of this room more full And though heaven will feel massive, right? To just catch a glimpse of one person in your life right now who does not know Jesus with you in heaven one day because of a hardship you went through. Would that be worth it? I think it would. So I want to pray for us today. Um, And would just ask you to bow your heads with me as we pray that we would be this type of church. God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the story of Joseph. God, it is so clear that your word is not made up or manufactured, that it includes deep, dark, broken moments of history. Stuff that 
ought to be covered up in this Redeemer resurrection narrative, but that would be a lie. That would be fake. But your word is true, and it is real. And we understand that part of the resurrection narrative is the narrative of the cross. Jesus, thank you that you have paid the price, the ultimate price, the one that we never could, by living the perfect life in our place, dying the death we deserve, and coming up out of the pit alive. Help us to trust in you, Jesus, but not only to embrace you as Savior, but to embrace you as Lord, to follow your lead to be willing to pick up our cross daily and follow you, to be willing to suffer for the cause of Christ, to be able to endure hardship willingly so that we can express the hope that is within us. And God, I pray for Faith Community Church. Would you mark this church as a church that has hope and hardship, regardless of what's going on today, tomorrow, this week, this year, or for decades to come, I pray that Faith Community Church would be a church that has the gospel fresh on its lips. That people would genuinely ask, tell us the hope that is within you. Why are you able to rejoice in the midst of suffering? And that we would get to advance the gospel all for your glory. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.